Hello, this is Chris Barney, and I'm recording this presentation for the Connecticut Game Developers Meetup. Um, I was unable to be there to speak with you all uh, last month, and so I'm recording this video for you now to uh, convey the, the information I wasn't able to, to talk about then, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to come to a meetup next month and uh, do a Q&A for this. It's going to be a high-level overview of uh, game patterns, uh, game design patterns, and pattern language, and the process of writing a textbook. Um, and cover as much of that as I can in like maybe 20 minutes or half an hour. Um, try not to take up too much of your valuable time, uh, but give you as much for the bang for the buck as I can. So here we go. Uh, pattern language for game design. Uh, so I'm Chris Barney. I'm currently an independent game developer, uh, formerly, formerly worked at poptropica.com and funbrain.com uh, doing kids MMO, side scroller, uh, and educational games. Uh, I'm also I'm currently working as a game design professor in the undergraduate game program and graduate game science and design program at Northeastern University. And I've spoken at conferences all over the place on diversity in games, on the specific games I'm working on, um, and I'll be speaking on the Pattern Language book uh, at ECGC this, uh, uh, this spring. So that's who I am. Introduction to patterns. So patterns were originally created um, in the, or conceived of in the way we think of them now in the 1970s by Christopher Alexander. He was an architect uh, dissatisfied with the state of modern architecture and feeling like uh, we were missing something that we had understood implicitly in the past. Uh, he came up with this idea that, um, that well, he believed that um, all design exists to solve a problem and that if we look at existing design and uh, that is good and see what things are repeated across many designs that address the same problem, that we can derive patterns that we could then apply in a general way to solve similar design problems in our current work. Um, and his ideas were uh, very popular and influential in uh, architecture as well as uh, very soon thereafter in, uh, in programming, uh, particularly object-oriented programming. Um, the book Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, uh, written by the Gang of Four, is still one of the more influential programming books that's been written. Um, it's fair to say uh, that Alexander also generated quite a bit of animosity and controversy in the architectural field, and it's not like everybody adopted his ideas and moved forward with them. Um, he was pretty anti-establishment, um, anti-capitalist in, in a lot of ways, um, and believed that a lot of the problems in architecture stemmed from the process of production. I'll get around to that again by the end of the talk. Um, so applying patterns to game design. Uh, Patterns have been uh, applied to game design for quite some time. Um, it's been a while since there's been a book really dedicated to it. Uh, the book Patterns in Game Design by Bjork and Halpanen, um, probably mispronouncing the last name, um, was published uh, was close to 20 years ago now and uh, detailed a bunch of game design patterns um, and they have an online repository that now contains upwards of 800 patterns. Um, they don't approach it in quite the same way I do. They don't focus as much on what problem patterns solve, which I think is very important. Um, and then the book uh, Game Mechanics Advanced Game Design uh, by Adams and Dormans uh, also contains a lot of really good, um, very mechanical patterns and uh, proposes a very limited number of patterns as being really all that there are or that are needed. Um, it says maybe there's some others, you know, and you could like propose them if you want to, but probably this is it. Um, and because of the limited number of patterns proposed in their book and the lack of problems in uh, Bjork and Halepainen's book, uh, I felt like it was useful to revisit the topic um, and to, to pursue it uh, in a variety of ways in the classroom uh, practice and, and in writing a book. So, um, how did I end up creating patterns? Um, I was uh, guest lecturing, or not or lecturing, at Northeastern University um, and was offered their spatial and temporal design grad class and uh, accepted that. It sounded like a cool thing to teach. Um, in pursuing that, I started looking more at uh, formal architectural theory in games and uh, went back and actually read Christopher Alexander's book, A Pattern Language. Um, 
ended up using it as an assignment in the course, you know, read these patterns, think about how they might apply to games, um, and decided to have the students try their hand at creating patterns within game design. Um, and while well, the patterns they came up with uh, were sort of all over the map, a couple of them were fantastic. A lot of them were like, well, yes, that's a basic game design principle, duh. But then it is sort of, I realized that, yeah, they, they derived a pattern that is something that I know, you know, obviously is true, but I didn't tell them that thing was obviously true. Um, I said, look at a bunch of games, look at how, say, jumping is used and come up with a pattern. And they came up with a pattern about like increasing the level of jumping to increase the player's feeling of autonomy. And like, it's like, well, yes, that works. And you realize that works and that that's a pattern in game design all on your own. That's, that's amazing. Um, maybe I'm onto something here in terms of this process being useful um, as much as the patterns that are arrived at. Uh, I then taught uh, a level design and game architecture undergraduate course, which I rewrote to essentially be the grad course uh, minus some of the more challenging exercises. That was quite successful. Students enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I've now applied the ideas, uh, pattern ideas, to the foundations of game design course, looking to have students create some of these basic ideas or recreate some of these basic ideas on their own from first principles. Um, and to use that to internalize their, their understanding. And then uh, next fall, I will be teaching a course in generative game design that is sort of looking at meta patterns, maybe you would call them. Um, the idea that there are patterns in the order uh, that you apply patterns in order to get the best effect. Uh, so that looking at the design process and saying in order to make patterns most effective, you should apply them sort of in this way, uh, in this order as you're creating design. Um, and using that uh, as a way of considering how procedural or generative design uh, can be done. Um, so that will be upcoming. Now, uh, after I had started teaching the spatial and temporal design course and been thinking about patterns for a while, um, for that course, I was using the book An Architectural Approach to Level Design by Christopher Totten. Uh, who's a friend of mine through the Game Developers Conference for, for many years. Um, I was at the conference and talking to him about how much I appreciated his book and how useful it was to me and uh, talking about my ideas and patterns. And he got really excited and was like, this is, this is really interesting. I, you know, this is amazing. Uh, it's the most interesting thing I've heard in game design in years. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, what do I know? And he's like, no, 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 you're onto something here. Um, come down with me to the showroom floor and let's go talk to CRC Press and get you a book. And I was like, that, you're, you're insane. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be writing a book in game design. Who am I to do that? But, you know, he dragged me down um, and put me in front of their editors and had me pitch what I was working on. And they said, yeah, actually, we would really like to have uh, that book in our catalog. So uh, talk to us after the conference and we will set you up with a writing contract. Um, I thought, well, they're, they're being nice to me, whatever. Um, but after the conference, I contacted them and said, hey, uh, what do I need to do? They sent me forms to fill out. I filled them out and submitted them. And lo and behold, they presented me with a contra uh, contract for uh, actually writing uh, a book. So getting that contract, I was given a year to do the actual text writing for the book. Um, and at the end of that time, I needed to submit a completed manuscript. There were a number of submission steps along the way. Uh, the sort of normal contract that you can expect for something like that was saying, all right, you can have, you know, 10% uh, of sales up to like the first 5,000 sales. And then if there's more than 5,000 sales, your percentage goes up somewhat. Um, we reserve the right to publish second editions of the book. And, you know, if we choose not to republish the book and it goes out of print, then the rights revert to you and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, all seemed pretty reasonable. So uh, I accepted. Uh, no upfront money. They're not, they typically do not pay you to write a textbook. They pay you for the sales of the textbook that you write because you want to. So you're not going to get an advance of, you know, a million dollars to go write a textbook. Um, at least not if you're uh, a starting writer. Um, and then uh, I was given uh, some period of time for revisions. It ended up being about three months. Uh, I finished the book in May um, and uh, like August or so, I needed to have all of the revisions for the book in. 
And then um, the book actually was published in December. Uh, so like 18 months or so after uh, I started writing. Uh, I then took an additional six months to produce a website that goes along with the book uh, and, and supports that work. I'll provide a link to that at the end. Um, and uh, I think is very useful. That was not part of the contract, but I think it is important to the content I was producing. Um, all right, so yeah, and then also ongoing promotion. So I continue to write blog articles, run a Facebook group, do talks like this, uh, and probably will for some time um, until I'm convinced that everybody who might be interested in the topic has been made aware of the fact the book exists. Um, I, mean, I don't think that writing a game design textbook is a good way to make a lot of money. Um, maybe my opinion of that will change, that would be great, but uh, I think it's mostly something you do because you feel a need to uh, in, in the education field uh, or in the industry for some information that you have to convey um, and you go out and do the writing. So, um, yeah, so this whole pattern process, what is it? What are we talking about here? Um, so I've mentioned the idea that uh, all design exists to solve a problem and that patterns are proposing a generalized solution to a particular problem. Um, so that other people who have that problem can apply your pattern and come up with a solution that fits their particular needs as opposed to just copying some set of techniques, right? It's not a recipe, you know, do these things uh, in order to uh, solve the problem. It's, it's more generalized than that. Um, so how do you go about um, arriving at this, uh, this generalized solution? Um, the basic process that all of the exercises in the book follow, there's 25 or so exercises that guide you through creating patterns of different types. Um, and uh, the basic shape of those is pick a seed uh, starting point. Most often that's a design technique. So you're going to look at how jumping is applied in games or you know, how uh, you know, perspective uh, is applied or how um, anger is generated in the player or how you know a sense of sadness is created in the player um, all different kinds of things can be seeds and there's slight differences in the exercises depending on what kind of seed you're looking at you can also start by saying i have a particular problem and i'm going to look at other games that have solved that problem so in that case the, the problem that you're having is the seed um, then look at as many games as uh, that use that technique or solve that problem as possible uh, in the exercises I call for 10, um, that's less than 10 um, is meaning you're probably not finding a broad enough base to come up with a pattern that's really generalizable and telling people they need to come up with 100 examples means that no one would ever complete an exercise. Uh, so 10 seems to be something that's doable, but makes you stretch a little bit and sort of find the edges of, of the possibility space. More is better. Um, you know, if you had a team of people working on a pattern and you told each group or each person in the team to find 10, that would be even better, um, but at least 10. Um, and then you look at what design problem each game uses the technique to solve in the case that you're starting with the, with the technique. So, you know, if you're looking at games that use jumping, uh, why are they using jumping? What does it accomplish in the game? Um, you know, is it used as one avenue of player progression? They gain more and more jumping abilities that allow them to traverse more terrain. Um, is it used uh, to just simply to get people across the terrain as part of navigation? Um, you know, does, does it change over the course of the game? Uh, is it the primary game mechanic? Is it the combat mechanic, right? So Super Mario Brothers, the primary combat verb is jump um, or land, I guess, maybe. Um, so how are they using it? What problem are they using it to solve? And then once you have all of those things, all of the games described, all of the ways they use your technique described, then you take that, that body of writing and look for patterns across all of those games uh, in the way that they're using the technique, what problem they're trying to solve. Um, you just you know, write those patterns down in a shorthand form, and then you start to record them using the pattern template which asks you to flesh out a bunch of different aspects and provide clear examples and your confidence level in the pattern and so on. And the book discusses that in a great deal of detail. Um, so that's the basic process. Uh, patterns normally have maybe six or seven steps uh, that, that break that down a little bit. And like I said, there's 25 in the book and that's by no means 
all of the exercises or types of patterns you could create. All right, so uh, I've said pattern language a couple times, right? And, and the Alexander book is called A Pattern Language. What, what does that mean as opposed to just a pattern? Um, you know, are the, the 16 object-oriented computer science patterns a language? What, what do you mean by that? Uh, why, would you, why would you want a language? So the basic idea is that uh, games or architectural projects or, or any design problem is probably complicated. Um, a single pattern is probably not enough to solve that problem. Um, and you could start producing patterns to solve your problem and, and come up with the patterns that you needed and, and just have them all be independent, but you, you made them so you know they exist and you apply them. But in all likelihood, you're looking at some kind of a library of patterns, right? Like some collection that already exists and maybe you're contributing to it. Uh, maybe you've built it over the course of your career. Maybe your team is building it. Um, but there's a bunch of patterns. Um, trying to figure out which ones you should apply under what circumstances is, is difficult. Um, how do you even, like there could be a perfect pattern that you should be using and you just don't see it, don't know it exists in the shuffle of, of things that exist either on a uh, library website or, or you know, in some kind of a database or, or just a stack of papers where you've written them down. Um, you're never gonna find the patterns you need. So you need a way to search the patterns and to link them together. So pattern language you know, is saying, we're going to link these things together using things like keywords, like um, you know, what different things it relates to. Uh, maybe a jumping pattern you know, would have keywords like player autonomy and uh, mobility and jumping and uh, you know, ab player avatar, because you, you probably don't have jumping if you don't have an uh, in-game avatar for your character, uh, things like that. And then hierarchy is saying patterns are related to each other. Uh, if you don't have uh, a high level pattern that's governing, governing motion in your game, then you're probably not gonna have jumping. Um, and if you have a pattern that uh, governs jumping, but you also have a game that really has a lot of player progression, then there's probably a pattern that governs how you're changing the player's ability to jump over time to be in line with the kind of progression you're trying to create. So you have high-level patterns and mid-level patterns and low-level patterns um, that are all linked together in uh, a tree or graph structure. Um, and uh, that, that complete tree or graph structure uh, solves your, your set of design problems for a particular project. Um, that's saying that your, the design language is not all of the patterns that exist, right? Like a pattern repository might have you know, 200 or 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 patterns in it. Um, you're not going to apply 10,000 patterns or even, you know, 500 patterns probably to a particular project. Um, you're going to have some smaller set. Uh, the other things just aren't going to be applicable. Um, you know, patterns that govern things uh, in Tetris aren't the same patterns that govern things in Call of Duty, uh, which aren't the same as govern things in Disco Elysium, right? Different kinds of games, different intents, different audiences, different patterns. Um, so, the language is the set of patterns that are connected together and address your current design needs. You will use a different language if you create a different project later, uh, a different person building a, um, a design for, for the project that you're currently working on might select a different set of patterns to, uh, to produce that design. So the, the pattern language is something that you se select from a larger group of patterns or create it yourself to solve a particular design problem. All right, so ways to use patterns in active development. If you aren't an educator and you're you know, either an independent designer or working in a studio, how do patterns apply to you? Um, so there's sort of three different places that I see patterns really easily fitting into a design process. The first of those is in pre-production, um, that you're building a pattern language from a repository or by yourself to understand and explore the design space that your project uh, is in uh, and using it to create your initial design. So basing your design on a pattern language. That's a lot of work, requires a lot of buy-in, probably not gonna be anybody's first use of patterns. Um, currently working on uh, developing Northeastern uh, University's game design studio and working with students to start producing uh, larger games on a yearly basis. And we'll be building those games from the ground up using patterns. Um, because I think that will help the students understand their design 
and I'm interested in seeing the outcome of really pattern-based design and, and whether or not it produces higher quality games. We'll find out. Um, I think it will. Second place is in production. Um, if you're in the process of producing design and you have a particular problem that you need to solve, a particular challenge you're facing, um, rather than just saying, well, this other game that's kind of like ours does this, we'll do that too. Do a pattern analysis, um, starting with that problem, and uh, or the, the game design element that, that relates, and figure out what the pattern is that solves that problem, rather than just copying a solution across. Um, so, or if you have um, a manager who comes in and says, we're adding this feature, we're changing the design in this way, and you go, I, I wonder what the consequences of that are going to be. How's that going to affect our, our project? You know, you might be saying, I'm pretty sure that's a bad idea. Um, or just like, I don't know how to adjust the rest of my design to compensate for that. Doing a pattern analysis on the, um, the kind of change that they're asking for, looking at how games that have that uh, design in element in them uh, function, and then using that to, to be able to articulate and communicate the consequences of uh, the design change you're being asked to make. And then the last place is in postmortem. When you're looking at your game and saying either, you know, these things in the game worked really well, or these things, and we want to repeat that in the future, we want to know how we struck gold exactly. Uh, we're glad we did, but, but why did it work well? Or we were pretty sure this was awesome, and, and it fell flat, and we don't know what went wrong exactly. Doing pattern analysis again on those, uh, those design elements or aspects of the game, and seeing why they work in other places they work or why they don't work, uh, you know, will give you insight into why they did or didn't work in your case. Um, if you added an element that's worked elsewhere, weren't thinking about the pattern, um, didn't work for you, well, now's the time to do that analysis and understand why so you can understand your successes and failures. So those are sort of the main easy ways that I can think of applying patterns for active development. Using patterns in the classroom. So um, I think there's a number of different degrees to which you can involve patterns in a particular class. Uh, I think the simplest and, and sort of good starting point would be to say, let's examine existing games and match them to existing patterns. Uh, that would be good for an intro course, right? If you are talking about a particular game mechanic, search the existing pattern library and find patterns that relate to that mechanic and then say, all right, so I want you to uh, look at this pattern and find me you know, five games that aren't listed in the example games that use this pattern. Um, that's gonna help people get comfortable with that process. Um, I haven't done a lot of that so far because I tend to throw students into the deep end, um, make them create their own patterns and move forward. But I think there would be a lot of benefit to sort of starting more slowly um, if this was being integrated into a broad curriculum and having the first time patterns are introduced uh, not make students responsible for creating them. The second uh, is then extracting patterns based on course topics um, in order to cement understanding of, of the curriculum, right? So you, you take a particular topic, uh, you find the pattern exercise that closely relates to that, and you have students create patterns based around that exercise or around that seed, and those are going to allow them to dig into understanding a particular topic in the curriculum. Um, the third way is the way that I've mostly done it uh, in the architecture courses, which is to say, extract one or more patterns uh, in groups and then take those patterns and use them to create small scale design. So we're going to create you know, patterns around uh, emotion and then we're going to apply those patterns to try to create a scene that uses the pattern and evokes the emotion intended. Um, and you know, or, or whatever exercise you, you uh, find appropriate for your curriculum. Um, but that full process of you know, examine existing things, derive the pattern, apply the pattern and see if it works, um, you know, is very powerful. Uh, the classes I use it in are a lot of work for the students, but they seem to really appreciate them so far. So had good results. Um, and then, the fourth way uh, is what I will be trying with the uh, game design studio, which is building full games using a pattern framework to create a deep understanding of the design process. And that's, you know, it's patterns all the way down um, and focused on as a, a larger group building a full game, um, applying patterns to as many aspects of the design as possible.
All right. So uh, just to conclude, uh, since this has been a little, almost half an hour, um, here are some resources. Uh, the Pattern Language for Game Design uh, website that links to places where you can purchase the book as well as um, to the free Pattern Library website where you can look at all the patterns that exist from the book and ones my students are uh, creating. You can create an account and enter your own patterns, create patterns for your, or groups for your studios that are private to the studio, for your classes, for your university. Um, and build your own pattern libraries to use as needed, um, or share the patterns with the world. Um, right? You know, make them make them publicly available so everybody can uh, see whether they're useful or not. Uh, that's my design blog, uh, Perspectives in Game Design. Uh, I write about a bunch of different topics. Uh, lately, largely patterns, but there's plenty of other stuff in there too. That's the Facebook group for uh, Pattern Language for Game Design. Uh, I post to there regularly. Uh, on a bunch of topics, including you know videos from uh, lecture videos from the courses that I do where I'm applying patterns. Uh, that is the game mechanics book, uh, which is the Adams and Dorman's um, book, uh, Game Mechanics Advanced Game Design, which has a bunch of patterns in it. Uh, patterns in Game Design is the Bjork and uh, Halepainen book, which has lots of patterns in it. Um, and then uh, that's a link to a pattern language by Christopher Alexander. Uh, and Pattern Theory 101, uh, which is a book by Helmut Leitner, which breaks down the basics of pattern theory as they apply to architecture in like 100 pages or less, rather than uh, pattern, language, pattern language, which is closer to 1,000. So I hope this has been useful. Um, if it has been and you have questions, um, then hopefully I will come and do a Q&A to answer those for you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch.